<laughs> okay, hi everybody. Um, Suzanne here. Oh, here we go. Um, Suzanne here from Wellness Embodied, and I am here with Clara and our colleague Mikey. Um, just one sec. Hi. They're not muted. Am I? No, they can okay. hear you. Okay, well, we can't hear them, so oh. we need to. Oh, there we go. No, okay. I'm just going to pop you on mute. Sorry, we just had somebody pop in from the cycling club. Um, cool. So, all right. Um, so, Suzanne here, Clara, and Mikey is just popped down the front. Um, we're just dealing with the whole weather and arrivals and stuff here. And um, so we'll just give it a couple of minutes and we're also recording the Zoom, but you will have a chance to ask any questions um, either in the chat or live. Hello. Yeah, we're recording as well. So we're Zooming, but yeah, that sounds good. Can I get into sign in here? I know, I think it's horrible weather and finding stuff and yeah. Um, okay, so <laughs> I'm going to out of this. Oh, are we needed or not needed folks? Oh, oops. <laughs> um, doing a little um, little technical stuff with sharing our screen. Um, awesome. Okay, great. So we can start our presentation. Excellent, okay. Um, so you're not going to be able to see the slides, but we're basically just using them to talk anyway. We'll be able to do the slideshow later. Um, so I'm going to start, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about two techniques for managing anxiety and stress in kids. Um, the first one is craniosacral therapy, and the second one is a breathing technique called heart math. Um, so craniosacral, first of all, basically is a light touch technique, which is aimed at rebalancing the fascia and restoring space in the body systems. Um, so imbalances within your system, they can come in the form of imbalances within the bones of the skull. Um, so if we look at, we're just looking at a model of the cranium here, which I'll share on the actual Zoom recording in a second, but there's actually multiple bones of the skull. And what we used to think traditionally was that um, these bones were completely, that the seizures, that they were almost cemented together. Now what we know um, from various neurosurgeries and research into craniosacral is that between these seizures, you actually get little micro gliding movements. So that was kind of the start of the off pleasure craniosacral approach. Um, and when these seizures or joints of the bones of the skull aren't moving normally, it's associated with a range of different imbalances. And even if you think of anything that causes, say, tightness around your brain or around your um, tissues of the brain or your nerves, it's probably going to lead to like a little level of dysfunction. So at a basic level, that can be things like fatigue, anxiety, pain, and so on. When we move away from the skull and we look throughout the rest of your body tissues, um, we talk about releasing the fascia. So your fascia is like that thin filmy covering on a piece of meat. Um, or, you know, if you look at a body chart on the muscles, it's the whitey kind of thing that you see. But generally, when you look at a body chart of the muscles, the um, white fascial part that you'll see, you'll only see the really thickened parts of it. But in actual fact, fascia covers everything in your body. Um, so why would we have imbalances within that system, with, so within the fascia, within your connective tissues in your body in general, or within the cranium um, or skull. 
So basically, any residual energy um, which is introduced into your body can come from um, external trauma like accidents or quick flashes, can come from emotional trauma, it can come from different pathogens like disease processes, um, post-viral stuff is a big thing, toxic substances, so like heavy metal um, toxicity. Uh, someone else, you can take on other people's traumas and energies and then you talk about intergenerational trauma and things and then excessive radiation. Um, and a reason why that trauma might um, collect in a certain area of body it's basically there's a physical law called schrodinger's law of thermodynamics which basically states that things will automatically move towards the state of disorganization or entropy so if there's a state of disorganization in your body or somewhere else um this law states that everything will sort of move towards that state um so that's that's a little bit of kind of science behind that um, the type of people that I see, so craniosacral, so I'll just show you here, um, the craniosacral system itself is made up of that brain and the bones of the skull and the spinal cord um, and the meninges. So cerebrospinal fluid, which is like the nervous system's lubricant, is manufactured in the brain and it's pumped down along the sacrum. Um, and basically we're feeling for various imbalances and stuff within that. Um, so when we do a craniosacral treatment, we have like a number of listening points throughout the system. So um, we can actually feel that cerebrospinal fluid flow or pulsation right throughout the system. Um, and we're just trying to feel if there's an imbalance. And that's kind of like almost feeling if you had like a heart rate variation or a um, breathing imbalance or something like that. It's an entirely different pulse rate all of its own. So what I was going to show you guys from the point of view of um, craniosacral is just a couple of self-release um, things. And then I can also like guide you towards, so on our YouTube channel, I have a video where I've done a free um, like self-guided release. There's another video which I think is on our YouTube of a presentation I did in Mexico, um, which was called Free Your Fascia, Free Your Life. And it's just that connecting in with your own tissues and it's a really calming um, thing for increasing body awareness and quite a meditative thing. So the disclaimer, I guess, is that you never, you're never really going to be able to fully connect in with your own fascia or tissues the same way as in a therapy session. Like I can't connect in with mine as well as what I could with somebody else because, you know, like I'm sitting or I'm thinking about it or I'm, I have like a preconception of what I'm going to feel or whatever. Um, but, you know, it is a nice technique and it's a nice thing to try with people. And we do have like a long version of the Free Your Fascia, Free Your Life course, which is on our website, which you can get for lifetime access on purchase. Um, and like further reading on that trauma in the tissues and stuff, which is really excellent for like teachers and health professionals and everyone, I think it's great. It's a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Have you read that? No. Um, it's by a psychiatrist called Bessel van der Kolk. And it's basically based on his life's work. Um, so it, he talks about there being three ways of healing trauma. So there's like the top down approach, which is like your psychological treatments. There's the bottom up approach, which is like, um, body work. And that can be anything from yoga to dance, to massage, to craniosacral, to kinesiology. So lots of things which kind of depends on the person. Um, and then you know, obviously there's your medications and stuff, but he was actually around when Prozac came out. And so he's kind of like, well, Prozac was great, but if it was that great, why isn't it going to George? Um, so that's that. So I'll just stop the screen share for the moment. Um, and I'll guide through on the Zoom and on here. Um, 
I'm going to guide you guys through a little bit of a self-release technique, but there's actually a lot of this on our um, YouTube video for free. But basically what you're aiming to do, the touch, the um, level of pressure that you put on yourself, or even if you're trying it on your child or a partner or something, is if you get your hand out and get a five cent piece onto your hand, that's the level of pressure that you want. So it's really, really light touch. So you'll feel if you were to put your hand out and you had like, say, even your ring or something, um, if you put like a ring onto your hand, so over time, that will become that will feel heavier and heavier because it kind of starts to sink into your tissues and just that general thing of holding something for a period of time. Um, but, so that's the same thing happens with your fascia. So when we're holding, 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 over time we'll start to feel the tissues will mold underneath our hands and we'll start to sink into them. Um, and that's quite a natural thing that happens. And sometimes if you're doing it on someone else or on yourself, you'll feel like a warming or a sensation underneath um so what we'll do so just to show on the actual video link as well just the bones the um skull model that i have here and um, so we'll start off really easily with um we'll actually do a sinus one i reckon because on the video i have on youtube i've got like this frontal bone i've got an occipital release um and i've got some uh, jaw stuff so we'll maybe start with a sinus thing and it might be quite nice with this humid weather so what you're going to do if you close your eyes and get your arms as comfortable as you can so kind of if you can rest them on like a table or something or ideally you're lying down then that's really good we just um did a little really quick explanation of craniosacral therapy what we're just doing it's like a body check-in right now so i'll give you guys a second um so yeah remembering this idea that the level of pressure that you're going to put on is like as if you have um a five cent piece or like a ring or something like that on your hand or on your arm so it's very light um and we're, we're going to do like a sinus release um so yeah just resting your hands and your arms as much as you can and you're just going to press your um, index fingers, just at the top of that nasal bone there. And you're just gonna rest them as lightly as you possibly can there. So what I would say, just go lighter. Whatever you're doing, go lighter, lighter, lighter. And you're just gonna breathe with that. And just focus on the feeling of your fingers at that sinus. So at your nasal bone. And you start to feel your fingers might want to slip or your hands might want to slip um, or your arms might want to hang down, but just pay attention to if your fingers are being guided around in a twisting motion, if you feel like your fingers are getting heavier, like the tissues drawing you in, um, if you feel like you're just pushing your fingers in towards that nasal bone, that's not what you want. So try and lighten your touch in that case. And then what I'll get you to do is just imagine that your fingers are like um, fans, like floor fans. And imagine that you're turning the fan on. So you're pumping all this air, or in this case, energy, pushing this energy forwards into that nasal bone. So just under your fingers, just imagine you're just directing energy into the top of your nose. And then just imagine you're turning the fan off. So there's no energy, you're just taking, you're just resting your fingers again. And just pay attention to see if your fingers feel any more connected with the tissue with any of these states. They may not, and that's fine. So this is something to think about and have a look at the videos and go through again. Um, 
And then the third state is imagine that the air is reversed and it's like you're kind of sucking air or sucking that energy back out of the bones. It's almost like you're trying to draw the bone. You're keeping that connection with the bone like glue, but you're trying to draw the bone back away from where it's meant to be. And then when you disengage from the tissue, you don't want to just take your hands off really quickly. What you want to do is just really, really slowly and in your own time, just let your fingers peel away from the tissue and come away. So that's really quick. Um, so <laughs> did anyone, I'm not going to be offended by the way, hands up if anyone felt anything or if you felt like there was a difference when you changed that energy or oh, you guys have just come in so you're like what is she yeah. talking about? We'll send the video link and stuff later. Um, so we're talking about craniosacral for management of things like stress and anxiety but it, um, what I guess I didn't touch on is like the say with kids I get everything from like babies that can't sleep in the car or can't settle at night or have colic or something to like kids um, with ASD, functional neurological disorder, or just who are just like prone to being emotional. Um, and it's it's quite interesting that like different dysfunctions for want of a better word that you see in those cranial bones and stuff. Um, did anyone feel like their sinuses were a little bit more open or feel like there was anything happening around the tissue? It's okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. Yeah. No. We're in there. We're parked in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Um, yeah, cool. Okay. So that's a really quick thing of Crane like, well, but definitely have a look at the um the video where I go into a little bit more detail and you can try it in a more relaxed state. So it's on our YouTube. Um the next thing I wanted to touch on super quickly was a technique called heart math. Um now I don't really have a lot in the slides about this, um, because I was just gonna do a really quick breathing um technique. Oh wait, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, but we'll just flick back to the slideshow anyway because I know Clara's going to be talking after. Um, so heart math is basically a coherent breathing pattern and it's got a lot of scientific research showing health benefits. Um, it's called heart math because it's about connecting your breath with your heart. Um, and it also looks at heart rate variability. So heart rate variability is really different from just measuring your heart rate. It's basically how your heart rate should change um, as you go, like really fluidly as you go between different states. So my heart rate sitting here should be really low. If I go, oh, I'm gonna run around the velodrome now, it should go really high quite quickly. Like it should be able to switch between those states really quickly. And you can change your heart rate variability um, through your breath, so through really calm, controlled breathing. And basically, the, the more variable people's heart rates are day to day, so the quicker they can go into that changing heart rate system, um, the better general health they're in. So people with poor heart rate variability, it has been linked with multiple other health concerns. So you can look up the heart map website and there's heaps of information and research and tools and things you can get on that, so various apps and so on. Um, yeah, but we were going to go through, I'll go through probably about a two minute guided breathing um, thing, just to give you an idea of one of the heart math breathing um, tools. And this is kind of a nice one, I think, for kids in particular. So I'll get you to close your eyes. And what I'm going to get you to do is to come into a state of breathing where ideally you breathe in, say for a count of about five in and about five out. And if you can keep that breathing in and out through your nose, that's really great. So take a second just to relax your shoulders if you can.
relax your face. Relax your jaw. And try and really feel that breath slowing. And once you get to that state, I want you to imagine that that breath is flowing into your heart area. So just really visualize your heart. And just imagine that breath flowing into your heart and making it really nice and alive and vibrant. And then I want you to draw to your mind a something that makes you really happy or a particular event um, and try and make it as specific as you can. So it might be when you come home when your dog greets you. It might be, um, you know, catching up with a good friend for a coffee and try and make it something that's, you know, really day to day and something you really appreciate. So it's better to have it something simple that's easy to attain. Try and bring a smile to your face as well as you think about that. You're locking that breathing pattern in. You're locking that memory in or that thought. Just do another couple of rounds of that slow, relaxed, deep breathing. And then when you're ready, just opening your eyes. Did everyone find it easy to find something to um, anchor on? So that's a really nice, if people have an idea that breath work is really um, time consuming and that you have to be in a special place or you have to go to yoga or you have to pay to do it. Um, that is a really quick and easy thing that you can kind of teach somebody or that you can do, you know, in between meetings or that like say we could do in between clients or whatever as part of your day and it just kind of changes your energy. Um, and it's about bringing that gratitude in, but also bringing the scientific thing in with it as well. So changing that breathing pattern, which automatically will just reset your autonomic nervous system. So it just calms things down. Um, so that's my big little things. Yeah, we confused everyone. I will send out links to some of that other stuff. And um, I will hand you over to Cara, if I can share the screen. <laughs> oh, is that the start of yours? Yeah, yeah cool. Okay. Hi, hi, I'm Clara, I'm one of the physios from Wellness and Body. Uh, today, I would like to talk about vestibular rehab. That's what I do mostly with my clients. So the vestibular, to talk about vestibular rehab, probably we should understand first what the vestibular system is. I have a photo there so you guys can picture it in your head. So that's the ear, yeah. So that's the outer ear. Uh, that's something we can access through the finger where we get the infections. And then we have the tympanic membrane and that's the uh, middle ear, and then the inner ear is a bit deeper, all right? So we can't access it uh, from the outside of the ear. So the vestibular system is right there, is right next to the hearing system, yeah? They are like very well connected, all right? So why is this vestibular system important? It's very important because it helps with the balance. It's one of the systems that controls our balance together with the vision and everything that we feel and information coming from our skin and muscles. So I, as if you have to picture someone with balance problems, probably thinking about someone that is blind, you may notice that they need the stick and they need to use their hands to feel a bit better because they can't see, so they use other systems to compensate for that loss. Similar with someone with a vestibular system problem, the balance is gonna be off, so they're gonna use the vision way more and they're gonna use the hands or the feet to feel a bit safer. This vestibular system also helps with a movement or reflex that we have in our body that is called the vestibular ocular reflex. So this is something that develops as we age and what it helps with is 
um, to give us the ability to focus on a target what we move. So I can look at you and I can move my hair on and you don't become very at all, all right? So someone calls me, my head and eyes are gonna move together. If someone calls me, my head moves, but my eyes are there, I won't be able to see anything. So this is very important for us. And since we are little, we need it to develop. So today I'm gonna to talk about uh, what are the most common symptoms or problems that a kid can have when the vestibular system is failing. So you know when it's necessary with the idea is for you to give you idea when to ask for help or to ask for an assessment when appropriate. Yeah, if you find some certain symptoms or signs. So the vestibular system has always been there. It's just it hasn't been researched as much. In the last few years, there is new information coming, especially in adults. But new research is getting into, and they realize that a lot of kids have had the problem actually, but nobody found out because they were focusing in other areas. So it's pretty new. Not everybody's aware of it. And that's our idea as well, to uh, educate the people so they can pick it up and then ask for help when they need it. So the new research in America is saying that one out of five kids has vestibular, problems, uh, vestibular system problems. Out of those one out of five, only 29% get treatment. So there is a huge amount of people are not getting treatment. They're also finding that people that are, or kids that are underperforming at school, 69% of them have actually vestibular problems as well. So 69 of the kids that probably are not doing well at school might be because the balance wasn't right or this reflex is not correct. So then they have difficulties to focus on the teacher, to look at the book, to look again, they get dizzy, they lose concentration, and that's why they're not performing that well. Um, so this, the, the vestibular system, we have one with it, we have one on each side, and it's very important um, for us to develop it, right? So as if you have a kid or you have seen a kid, usually when we are born, the head is very wobbly, so we don't have tone or anything there. And as we develop, we start getting stronger from the head to the tip of the toes. So probably the first thing that the kids should do within the first three months is being able to lift the head and control the head. Then if you put them on the belly, they can lift the head up. Sometimes they start putting the hands and that's how they start crawling or later on walking. So why is the vestibular system important here? Well, it's the one that is gonna tell information to the brain. Okay, we're lifting up, we're seeing mommy or we're seeing the toy we want. Let's focus on that, let's walk or crawl towards it because we are interested in that. If the kid doesn't get that eye fixation, that target probably won't be interested. So it won't move, it won't be, or oh, the man will talk, the sibling will talk and they won't, they, won't, they won't be able to follow focus. And actually when we're growing, the only way we learn is with movement. Movement help us to start crawling. If we are interested in something we really want it, we're gonna do something about it. And that's how the kids actually developed. So having a failure on this system can make the kids have delayed motor skills or delayed in their milestones. So the kids with these problems, they are the ones that are born with these problems, or the ones they acquire later on, they actually take longer to achieve those milestones. So probably they won't walk at the age of one, they will do it at the age of two, or they will take longer. Yeah. Um, and later on in life, when they go to school, they will have these problems when writing or trying to read because their eyes won't be um, coordinated, yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> I said that already. So how do we know if a kid actually has this problem? Well, there are certain symptoms and signs that we can pick up as parents, siblings, teachers, or people around kids that if we think it said something that changed suddenly, like, oh, my kid used to be able to walk, and now every time he walks, he falls. Well, that's the concern that we should check with the doctor to see what happened. Or if the kid was born with that disability, or when we realize that probably they are too clumsy and coordinated, they are not getting the millstones, obviously the, the pediatrician should ask a question what was going on. In adults, the most common symptom is vertigo. The vertigo is the sensation that everything's spinning. Obviously, a two years old will be able to say, hey, mommy, I have vertigo. So that's when we have to look for different signs or symptoms. Um, in 
Um, another common symptom is nausea or vomiting or loss of appetite or kids that get motion sickness. Probably for, it's very common when your kids get motion sickness, but probably it changes suddenly that they were finding the car and suddenly they start changing or even in the pram or in the bike or in the swing, everything like that that makes them too sick, it should be a concern that something should be done on access. Um, so, um, sometimes the little babies, but obviously you, they can't tell if everything is spinning. Um, is this change in the kid that should be something, an alarm or sign to ask for help or assessment? Now the kid could be clinging to the parents or they might be failing, they can't fall asleep or they're not willing to move as they used to, they're not willing to stand up, yeah? So those are changes in the little ones that obviously, well, they can't say spinning, but if you notice those changes, it's good to have a look at why. So why these kids can have this? They are different pulses. Some kids can be born with it, and some kids can acquire as they grow. Obviously, when they're born with it, it's probably a bit harder to pick it up. But there are certain conditions that can help us, okay? We know this kid had this when he was just born, so and we know it's not developing well, so probably we could, we could check for the vestibular system. The most common ones are congenital malformations or kids with um, severe hearing loss. You know, like when the kids are born straight away, they do the hearing test and they pick it up straight away. Now they know it's like 60% of those kids that have the hearing loss because the system is so close to each other might have vestibular problems as well. So there are universities in, in Australia trying to push making the vestibular assessment mandatory for kids as well. So then the development delay doesn't happen. Um, another thing, it could be kids that unfortunately have been under um, heavy antibiotics or cancer treatment because all that can produce some death in the cells in the vestibular system. So again, if the kid has been ongoing with those bad treatments and then the development is not getting there. So if the kid has cancer, that doesn't mean that it shouldn't work. So yeah, it could be the treatment has affected the system. So those kids should be checked as well. Uh, so I, I saw this one, cytomegalovirus, very yeah. common, but not very common, but it can happen in pregnant women and then in early childhood, uh, the kids get a viral infection and affect the vestibular system as well. And very, very common in most of the kids is uh, otitis, so infection in the uh, outer ear. Kids with recurrent infections, yeah, they, as I showed you initially, the outer ear is very close to the inner ear, the infection will slowly um, get into deeper areas and can affect the nerves. So those kids are the ones that have a sudden change. They are like, oh, they can't get out. They can They start vomiting. They have. They have had fever. Uh, complain of earache. Those kids are the ones that might be developing a bit of imbalance problems. So if you hear earache, fever, repetitively, and then balance problems, definitely we know that something is happening there with the vestibular system. Um, and another very common one that probably is mistreated and misdiagnosed are the head concussions. So we know kids are climbing everywhere and hitting the head all the time. They might go to the emergency department because they vomit after, they do the MRI, everything is clear, but the concussion you won't see on the MRI. It's a more like it functionally changes and no like a brain damage. So those kids as well, they can feel like you, you can notice that probably their attention is gone or their tired low or their the, the mood has changed, they are more irritable or more depressed or crying all the time. And it's again the balance is off, vomiting, nausea. So all those kids with all those signs after the condition or they are born with it is the ones that we definitely need to have a look at them. So we are species we do a huge assessment to try to pick it up where it's coming from. Mainly what is going to tell us what's happening is the story from the parents and what the kid has, how the kid has changed or what they have noticed in the last few months or years. Knowing that, yeah, my kid had a head concussion and since then at school is doing bad and he's complaining of headaches and vomiting or nausea, we definitely know, okay, something needs to be done. He's 
finance system is off, his uh, fixation is off, we can fix that, we can do treatment. Same with after an infection or same a newborn that is not achieving the means goals. Um, so we do the assessment, we, ch we check the balance, and then we give them a lot of exercises to try to recover that. It's definitely something that can be fixed. The earlier the better, because if they are developing kids, definitely need to be done ASAP. Um, some of some exercises we give to kids will be like, we try to make it child friendly, obviously. When it's adult, it's way more boring, but always, yeah. Yeah. we have bubbles and kids have to uh, play get the bubbles and move the head around because usually they won't be able they won't be liking moving moving is gonna make them funny so trying to entertain them make them read a book what they are always saying uh, trying to get the balance jumping in the mini trams catching balls everything very kid friendly and things that they can do at home of course they need to do it at home and we see great results kids like they don't get they were doing bad at school and then changing their attitude kids that couldn't go to silks because they were getting sick now they can drive be in the car or in the car and do the activities they used to do so the changes are especially with kids you know like everything fixed very quickly so it's just a matter of training finding the right problem and then they do very well so the idea for me to give you is just to know what are the symptoms that we can find and if you have the symptoms and then some of those conditions like repetitive infections um, some malformations when they're born, some infections, um, head concussions, and plastic symptoms all together should ring the alarm. And yeah, you should ask for help for assessment. I'll um, stop the screen share for one sec and then open that to you for questions. Um, oh, yeah, any questions? I have questions. <laughs> so, so I have something to point out, first of all, which I guess is that the vestibular rehab and assessment. So we've got these special goggles that Clara looks at people's eyes on the screen and how their eyes move that's related to yeah. how their vestibular system is functioning. Um, but she's done hundreds and hundreds of hours of training in this. So I would say it's really important that you go to the right person for vestibular rehab. There's no point in coming to me for it. Like I get kids, but I get kids that will come to me for craniosacral and they've got like retained reflexes or there's just something um, that I get sometimes they maybe have dizziness coming from their neck that I can help them with and then I'll go oh, I just get you assessed by Clara too and so we have that kind of team thing yeah. going on and um, but yeah I wanted to ask about the vertigo after concussion in kids do they know if it's as high as in adult yeah yeah, yeah. it's exactly the thing or even worse uh, because everything is softer so they have more chance of getting BBPB like yes yeah. so the kids will have after I don't know if you hear about BBPBs, um, type of vertigo where the crystals move in your inner ear. So then when you roll in bed, you lay down, you everything starts spinning. So that's super common in kids after the concussion. Mm -hmm. They were like, when I did the course, I got concussion tested for them because probably they have it. And if they're given the wrong maneuver to correct it, like if they go to emergency or they go, you know, if they're just given the bog standard, like wrong maneuver, then they'll go, Oh, that doesn't work. Whereas they actually just been given the wrong maneuver in the first place. So they'll go, Oh, I went to accident and emergency and I had the vertigo treatment and it was worse than the vertigo. And you're like, Well, did it fix your vertigo? And they say, No. And you're like, Well, then it was the wrong treatment. So it shouldn't be worse than, you know, like they should get a really good thing. Yeah. From it. And actually, I have a funny story. It's not only a kid, it's an adult that she came to see me. She was actually her patient because she had headaches. And then she's like, oh, have a look at the vestibular system or something is not right. So I did all the testing and I found that she had that dysfunction. So she couldn't see the same when her head was quieter than when she was in movement. So um, she's like, um, I asked her, oh, I started asking her, okay, childhood. And she's like, oh, yeah, I used to have uh, infections in my ear like a thousand times, like constantly infections, constant infections. And I was like, oh, have you had any problems at school, like in your performance? Have you got? And she's like, oh, they always thought I was dyslexic because my mom was dyslexic and for me it was so hard to understand and follow things. Like it took me, I could read, I, could, I know how the words are written, but it just took me forever, forever to understand. And she's like, I'm actually, have, she's a nurse. I have a master's uh, that I achieved and I felt like, well, I can prove I'm not dyslexic, but she's like, it took me so much 
every text she had to read over and over again. And it was because of this. She, she's like, I'm so happy I'm not dyslexic. I knew it. Like everybody dyslexia, when you put the, the words in a different way, she's like, I knew how to write them. I didn't never have problems. It's just, I felt all my life I felt dumb. And I was like, oh, well, actually, this is what happened to you. Yeah, wow. Yeah. And so I had that happened many years before. Yeah, but nobody obviously didn't, was, what wasn't picked up. She coped with it. She probably didn't have severe symptoms that could offer, uh, make her go to the doctor. She wasn't spending all the time. She just, the ability to look at words was failing. So that's why she couldn't perform as good as the other kids were. But she was super smart. She got a master's yeah. with that disability. Yeah, so. yeah wow. So is there age? Yeah. Like, is there is there age just probably the knowledge is not there yet? Hopefully it will start getting there. Yeah. So the treatment isn't actually any manual. No, no, it's exercise. It's getting that head to movement, it's to getting the balance back or challenging. Yeah. One leg, walking on uneven surfaces, being a trump. Yeah, it's moving, moving, moving. You can have coexisting neck stuff. Mm. So that just depending on different types of dizziness, like you can have coexisting neck stuff and you, that would be like manual treatment. Or I guess if you guide them through the um, BPPV stuff initially, like you're kind of helping them up. Yeah. Yeah. If like it's have, a guide. Yeah, yeah. If they have the crystal thing, yeah, you have to, it's not manipulating the neck, but it's doing a manual to reposition the crystal. But that's a one to type thing when it goes away. So it's like by gravity, you move the head around, trying to put the crystal back. We do it with adults all the time as well. Yeah. Um, that's the only maneuver I will do. Then most of the time for vestibular only, if it's pure here, it's exercise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll just hang on. Are you sure again? I'm going to hand over to Mikey, um, who's going to talk about developmental milestones um whoops here we go <clears throat> so hi i'm mikey and i'm a physio as well as somebody and today i'm going to talk about motor development uh, and what we should expect uh on what age and uh, i'm going to talk to about the first uh, six years I'm not going to talk, uh, talk about the first year, like when they should hold the head, turning, all those things, but I start, let's start with year one. By year one, they should pull their, themselves to stand and walk with one help, hand held, and they should catch a rolling ball. So those are simple things that we would like them to do by that age. Uh, if they're one year and six months, uh, then we would expect them to walk alone kids uh, walk up and down stairs uh, with railings so they are holding on to something. Uh, they are already should scribble with a pencil but they are just holding the hand in a fist so mm -hmm. I'm not doing some <laughs> just scribbling. By two years we expect them to run jump uh, just both feet off the uh, floor and kick a large ball uh, on request <laughs> so when we ask them they try to do it. Uh, they throw a ball overhand and uh, jump uh, from the bottom uh, step both feet at once. Uh, they also can try to stand on one foot uh, without holding onto something. And uh, that's usually just picking like up and just putting it back down. Uh, they start uh, about to the play. They start to play uh, near other kids, but they don't play with them. So mm -hmm. this is called parallel play. They are just, they want to stay close to them, but uh, they don't. Uh, seem to interact with each other. So by year three, uh, they should uh, pedal tricycle and walk down the stairs. And now we expect them to stand on one foot and uh, sort of two seconds, so it's not a lot. Uh, we expect them to throw a small ball, ball overhand and uh, catches uh, and uh, them to catch a large ball with extended arms. So basically, they are not like this. <laughs> Sometimes the, the reaction can be late or too early. It depends how far you're going to throw the ball. Uh, can, uh, they can perform a broad jump. 
And uh, now the uh, games are more about role play. So they might play doctor appointments, they're playing uh, house, they're sort of like uh, uh, playing what they like, see around. And uh, about fine motor skills, now they are sort of, they can copy a circle. Uh, so we can't expect them to draw a big picture yet. <laughs> so by four years, um, they can run and turn in sharp corners. So they are already a little bit better at that and can change directions quickly. Uh, they can walk a narrow line and uh, draw two to four bar, uh, bar person. So maybe it's only head and body or uh, it depends. And they can cut paper in half, so they can use scissors. And play is now more about fantasy play. So they may, may play superheroes or all those things that you can see in TV. And they can walk on tiptoes and heels. By this age, we expect them to do that. And uh, can stand on their preferred foot uh, for six to 10 seconds. So that's longer now. And they can jump forward. Previously, they were sort of able to jump up, but now we expect them to jump forward. Uh, they can hop on a preferred foot for two or four times, and uh, and they can throw a tennis ball underhand, so using a, a hand like this. Uh, they can climb ladders with confidence. Sometimes they can miss a few steps there, but they can do these things already. By year five, usually they run quickly on uneven surfaces, so on a lawn, on, a, on the sand, uh, they're quite good at it. They can walk easily on narrow line, forwards, backwards, heel toe walk. Uh, they can balance on one foot for 10 seconds and they can skip. Um, they are able to throw and catch a small ball and a large ball from a distance of two meters. So the distance is getting further and further where we can throw the ball and can bounce a 10 centimeter ball like two or three times. Uh, fine motor skills, uh, perspective, of, uh, they can do a square, uh, copy a square. And they are quite skilled for, uh, in climbing, sliding, and they can do different kinds of stunts. And six years, uh, they can do star jumps. So it's basically hands and uh, legs, uh, open your hands and legs and back together. Can hop on right and left leg and can move forward with hops and can uh, stand on preferred food for 15 seconds and other food for 10 seconds. And can throw a tennis ball at the target, and that's uh, quite accurate. And uh, by six years, they can ride a bike without training wheels. So uh, by, six, by six years, they are already quite uh, good at everything. So, so that's why I just choose those ages, because this is the time when you can see the most rapid change in their skills. Uh, also, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the tests that we are using to, uh, take, uh, to check their uh, fine and cross, cross motor skills. That's called POT2 test. And this is for kids age four until 21. So it, it's quite big uh, age, age uh, yes. So it's, uh, the test is taking 16 minutes and it's really fun for kids because uh, he or she is doing different activities there. We are measuring, the, uh, for example, their fine manual control. So they are filling shapes or drawing lines through paths, they're cutting, they're folding. And after, all, after that, we just uh, going to evaluate that how they are doing. And uh, they're uh, coping different shapes like circles, squares, as I mentioned, this, this is um, like what, what age we expect them to do that. Then we measure that manual coordination. So uh, transferring different pennies, putting pegs into the pegboard, uh, or um, uh, upper limb coordination, dropping and catching a ball, dribbling a ball. Uh, also body coordination, so bilateral coordination when they do jumping checks, uh, tapping feet and fingers, and we measure balance. Uh, standing on one leg, standing on heel to toe, or using balance beam. And the last one that we can measure is strength and agility. So basically the shuttle run test and hopping tests and sit-ups and push-ups. 
So this is really good for us because it will give us uh, certain values. We can see in what age limit uh, the kid skills are. For example, we can see our uh, balance, is his or her balance as it should be, or is it above the average or below the average? So it will give us a good measurement to work on. And um, yes, so that's all about the test. And a uh, quick overview about uh, what we expect uh, from kids um, in certain age. So do you have any questions? And just to, so in terms of the, like the BOT, so it's rating like as above and, and below average, but it's also giving like an age match yeah. score. So it will go like, so if it's like a four year old, but they'll go right their balance or their fine motor skills instead of like a two year old. Like, does yeah. it give it in terms of months as well? It gives really accurate, like for example, uh, it gives 4.2 until yeah. 4.6 being expected to have that. So it's sort of when you have in, uh, when you're evaluating 11 year old boy and you can see like, okay, uh, his motor skills in balance, for example, are just sort of like four, four years, uh, 4.6, 4.8 between. And does it continue to teen years, those steps up to 14 and 16, or does it sort of? Uh, to stage 21. Yeah, so it's valid it's from four till 21. Mm -hmm. So you could get, say, like an 18 year old um, yeah. maybe applying for the NDIS yeah. who's like, whatever, right? Like functional neurological disorder, ASD, or cerebral palsy, or whatever. It will give you um, the age match scores in those seven areas. So mm -hmm. you give me an average, and yeah. then you compare, okay, your score was this one, your age should have this, but you are performing like five years, yeah. five years younger than you. To interpret that test, we have like a big book, yeah. and you just, <laughs> it's like really, yeah, you just have to take to a correct table, and then you see what's normal for them, and then you can see it. Yeah, so and then also, oh, uh, obviously you picked not as physios, but okay, you perform badly on your fine motor skills, so obviously that's going to be an aim on your treatment plan to yeah. get you better at that. That is, yeah, that's really good uh, where to start from and see how the treatment is uh, influencing it, for example, balance or coordination. Is there a recommendation though as to how often you should do it? Like, is it like that you would do it yearly or...? I think it depends what yeah. you see, but it, yeah. You want to, because they're kids, you want to give them a little bit time to get better. Uh, yeah. Sort of, yeah, half a year would be okay as well. Yeah. Yeah, I guess if it's a neurological disorder, you probably need a longer period of rehab. Yeah. If it's yeah. something more acute. Yeah, like if you do with like a Yes. Does anyone have any other questions about anything you were like hoping to see covered that we didn't talk about? We complicated doing like a Zoom and doing a. I don't know where to look. Yeah, anything you wanted to add? So, in terms of the vestibular, like the um, mandatory, like what they're pushing for the mandatory vestibular assessments. Mm -hmm. Who would perform those? Would it be like an ENT? Well, I think until they resolve that, yeah. Yeah. No, are, I think audiologists probably. Yeah. Because um, those are laboratory tests. Yeah. So it's like the ones that they do for adults. Yeah. Uh, so the kids can be connected electrodes and things like that. And they, they do it's called caloric testing. So they see it by computers with response. Like if you were doing an audiology test, but this is more about the response of your vestibular system. So mm -hmm. in adults, it's been done by audiologists, so I think that's course how it's going to continue. Yeah. yeah. And newborns, we as VCOs have, we do the functional testing and they do the yeah. other type of testing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, hopefully Australia is the leader in that research, so hopefully they get it out soon. Yeah. Cool. We'll be good. Let's talk to them. Mm -hmm. We're doing, and then 
yeah, I like going on time. Thanks everyone for coming.